It's, a, it's, a, it's a, actually a great pleasure to introduce Jaime, who many of you know, because uh, he was, he was my, my former PhD supervisor so, uh, and, and a close friend. And um, I, will, I have to give a short biography of Jaime, because uh, that's what you usually do when you're in this position. So Jaime got his PhD degree from, uh, from the Helmut Schmidt Universität in Hamburg after getting his diploma degree from electrical engineering from the Universität zu Karlsruhe in Germany, both in Germany. Uh, he got his bachelor from Colombia because he's originally from Colombia, but since 1995 he lives in, uh, in Mexico City. Uh, and he works at the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, that's UNAM, the National University of Mexico, as a researcher. So. <coughs> Uh, where he has been ever since, he is now has the highest uh, possible uh, recognitions in Mexico uh, and also at UNAM. He served also as uh, technical committee chair for the technical committee 8.4, that's it, that is uh, biosystems and bioprocesses, and then as uh, CC8 uh, coordinating committee chair in uh, ending in 2011. Uh, he, of course, has uh, a lot of uh, research interests which go from nonlinear control of uh, uh, nonlinear control and observation and observers uh, with an emphasis recently on Lyapunov methods for high order sliding modes uh, with applications with a lot of applications to biochemical processes, uh, wastewater treatment process with which I've been working with uh, with, with him and some electromechanical processes and of course the design of nonlinear observers. So I will leave you with, with Jaime, who will surely give a very interesting talk on uh, robot control and observation of nonlinear processes using discontinuities. Thank you, Jaime. Okay, thank you, Alejandro, for the nice presentation, introduction. Um, first, I want to thank the organizers, Olivier and um, Benoit, for inviting me to give this plenary talk. I am very excited to give it, and I hope you enjoy um, the presentation and the uh, talk as much as I have enjoyed that, um, thinking about that and preparing that. Is, um, I should also maybe apologize because um, I am not going to give a talk very particularly on bioprocesses and biosystems, um, but um, they are pro there are problems. I'm going to talk about problems. I have been very strongly motivated to by working on biosystems and bioprocesses. And I will show you uh, some very simple examples, the most simple possible uh, models for biosystems bio from which I have, uh, I hope, learned something interesting that I want to share with you. So, um, and there are, um, beyond trying to share with you some of these thoughts I have, um, uh, Dawn and uh, some of, of, of the lessons I have learned, um, there is also a light motif in this presentation, and this is um, the use of discontinuities to, to improve or uh, to solve some problems in um, estimation problems and control problems. So now, now we have it. Um, I can start. So the talk is divided, I, I will give a, a brief introduction and then I will, I will talk about three um, problems um, where I, in principle, want to, to illustrate how these continuities can help to solve these problems. I mean, these are very classical problems, I mean, at least uh, two of them. The, the, this one is not so classical, but these two are very classical ones um, and um, how can, uh, why these continuities are good for solving these kind of problems. Um, so this is um, uh, first um, how to estimate states. This is rather classical, but inputs, inputs um, are not so easy to estimate. Um, um, and these continuities can help in doing that. And um, if you use integral control, this is a very classical, it's the most classical control possible, that using these continuous integral terms, uh, 
can improve a lot the possibilities of uh, these PID-like controllers. And um, I will come to this topic also. Uh, observers that, that are multivalued and why it is, this may be interesting to look at them. So, um, oops, sorry. Yeah, have to learn to deal with the delay here. <laughs> so, um, it, is, it is very well known that these continuities um, are useful for dealing with uncertainties and robust problems. This is nothing new and there are a lot of um, uh, there is a lot of work in the community about that. I mean, uh, just think about sliding mode control since the end, end of the uh, 50s, beginning of the 60s. Um, switching control ha that has been very strong in the 90s and so on, and hybrid control, etc. Et so this is not a new idea. Um, and these continuities are good uh, because they are, on the one side, very simple. It's very simple to implement, apparently at least, to implement our, uh, this continuous control, but um, they are also amazingly good for dealing with uncertainties and perturbations. And, uh, and uh, uh, my point of view and the one that I want to, to, to share with you is, or to, to, to bring to you is that um, in some sense you can explain that in, because these continuities are, uh, is, uh, uh, a discontinuous uh, function, for example, the sine function, is a very simple model for a large class of signals. Uh, so you can use discontinuities in some sense um, as an internal, in the internal model principle, as a model to compens to estimate and compensate perturbations. This is a way of looking at that. This is, of course, not the only one, but um, I think this is a very nice way to look at that. Um, and, and then I want to illustrate that in three um, in the accompanying paper I put a fourth one but I will bring to you these three control estimation problems and um, in the meanwhile also some lessons some, some lessons that I have learned from very simple uh, processes I mean some of these problems I have been thinking about them for, for a long time um, so, I am slow, but uh, maybe um, there is something interesting there. Okay, so let's start with, the, the, with this first uh, problem about exact state and input observers for nonlinear systems. That means um, you want to estimate states, this is classical, but also the input that, um, that you don't know, some input um, that... Uh, enters in the system, this can be thought of, for example, in bioreactors bio or in, in general in reactors, reaction rates can be thought as inputs that you want to estimate, faults or perturbations whatsoever. So it's um, sometimes interesting to try to estimate these inputs. Um, the problem with estimating inputs in contrast to estimating states is that inputs live in a in finite dimensional space. So basically you cannot do that with a finite dimensional system uh, observer. So you have usually, um, I mean, you can do that approximately, and that's uh, the usual way to do that, um, using, for example, high gains. With high gain observers, you can try to do that to approximate the value of the input, but you can never really get the exact input. And the other way, to do that is to build a model of the input. If you have a model, an exosystem modeling the input, then you can estimate this input. But the class of inputs that you can uh, truly and exactly estimate uh, is a rather small class uh, of signals compared to the infinite dimensional space where they live in. But using these continuities, um, um, it is possible to do that. And my explanation for that is that this continuity, in fact, is a very simple model for this class of signals. Um, so, and, and, they, and they deliver a very simple observer because if you put an exosystem, so the class of signals that, that you can model 
increases if you increase the, the, the size of the exosystem, and then the observer will increase in size. So it will be, become very, very complicated. But in, I insist, with these continuities, uh, you don't need to do that. <coughs> now, uh, let us do that in a small system. Th this can be generalized to an arbitrary order system, but let us put that in, the, um, in this two-dimensional case. So let us assume we have a nonlinear system described by uh, these nonlinear equations with two states and one input that we are not able to measure. So um, uh, we assume that um, both the states and the input uh, are in, in a compact set, both are in compact sets to simplify things, and that G and H are uh, uh, smooth functions. And you can measure just uh, the output um, um, G. So the problem is then using the measurement of D um, um, to estimate set and the input. So the first thing, it is obvious, we need to um, assume some observability properties of the system, otherwise it is not possible to do that. Um, so the first thing is to assume, for example, that um, uh, this is the problem we can solve uh, using these continuities, for example, that, the, um, that this is a Lipschitz continuous function and its derivative is bounded. Um, so this is necessary in order to uh, make an state state extension so that uh, we introduce a new state, uh, which is this input, um, and its derivative is just um, the, uh, a function that we don't know. G3 is a function that we don't know, but we know that G3 is a bounded function. So this is, um, and so by extending the system, we have three states. The, the input is now a, a state, um, and then we can try to build an observer for that. Of course, uh, this G3 that we don't know is an un another unknown input for this system. But nevertheless, we can try to study the observability map, and we need then to require two ba basically two things that, uh, for observability. I mean, one is the invertibility of this observability map. This is classical observability. But we also need to be able to estimate the new state, the input, independently of the unknown input G3 that we have, the, the new. So these two conditions um, are equivalent to having the so-called strong observability for, um, for systems with unknown inputs. So this is, we, we need these properties in order to be able to do that. Now, um, if, if we have that, um, if this map is invertible, then we can make a change of course, make a transformation to simplify, uh, to write the system in a, in a simple uh, form, uh, which is this. Um, this is basically the observability form. So um, this is very well known. And in this case, we, ha we have, uh, since, since we don't know um, everything, then uh, we assume that we have two terms here, k of x, which is a known term, and u of x and um, the derivative of um, uh, u, which is unknown. This is uncertain term. So um, with the assumptions we have already done, um, we, can, we can assume that this term u, this function, is bounded by some constant mu. But, um, that we are assumed to know or um, to have a, a, an estimate of this value of mu. Now the problem in these new coordinates is just to estimate using the output uh, y, uh, the three state that we have now. Um, okay. Now the problem building a continuous observer for this system is that the input, um, that there is an uncertainty here, that we we don't know. So it is basically impossible with a continuous observer to estimate exactly the states. You can do that approximately, but you cannot do that exactly. Um, 
you can, using high gains, be, um, make this um, the error as small as you want, basically, but um, at the cost of, of increasing the gain uh, uh, of having a very high gain. One way to look at that, why it is not possible, is that this class of signal is too, too big. And the class of signals described by this inequality is too big, um, it's too large. So um, it is basically, um, it, it is not easy to, to, for, for the observer or the continuous observer to compensate for this uncertainty. Um, uh, again, you can, you can build a finite dimensional model, but you get a complex observer and the class of signals that you can model with a finite dimensional model is relatively small. Uh, but the discontinuous can do that. Mm -hmm. um, okay, Le so this is, um, this is an observer that is, a discontinuous observer that is able to estimate uh, exactly the, um, the three states, that means the, the two states and the input. And um, I have to, to clarify what, does, what this means. Um, uh, this is a uh, sign power of a variable. Yeah. This means um, if you take the power P of Z, um, this is, uh, since, for example, if Z is negative and P is one half, then we would get an imaginary number, but we don't want to have that. Uh, we want to have um, the, the square root, for example, of the absolute value of Z, and then we put back the sign of Z. So this is a sign power. So th this will appear uh, very often here. So this is, uh, this is basically the sign function. Is the power to the power zero, but you keep the sign of this um, variable, and this is um, two third power of this um, for, of the error estimation error and so on. So this is uh, this is an observer for this um, for this observability form. Okay, going back is not a good idea apparently. Um, I wanted to, sh to recall you the, the observability form. So, uh, and basically what we have is a very classical observer in the sense you make a copy of the plant, you don't copy you because you don't know you, and you, in and you add some um, output injection terms. And the output, output injection terms are rather similar to the high gain observer, just the difference is that uh, these functions are nonlinear. Um, these three functions are nonlinear. In the high gain observer case, this, the powers are always one. But in this case, you change these powers. I don't want to go into the details why, but um, what is important here is that this one, this one is a discontinuous function. This is the sine function. And this is the term that is able to compensate for the uncertainty in you, that, that uh, what the observer doesn't know. We don't have a copy of you, and because we don't know the, the function u, um, capital U, so this term is responsible for compensating this term. In, in, in fact, this term is able to estimate the value of u, yeah, and then to compensate for that. So this is um, a way um, to look at that. Of course, you cannot prove that in that form, but, um, but this is the way it works. Um, so this observer, which is very simple, um, compare, for example, to making an exosystem, to building an exosystem to try to uh, build a model of the um, unknown um, input, um, is much simpler um, than any uh, observer based on, a, on an exosystem. Um, by the way, I, I should say that this, is, uh, this is structure is not identical, but it's uh, borrowed, borrowed by, from the um, Levant's differentiator, um, Ari Levant's differentiator, who has introduced that um, uh, 20 years ago. 
Okay, but this structure is very similar also to the high plane observer. So the, 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 the structure of the observer is identical basically to, the, to a high gain observer, but the difference is to use this discontinuity and the, the, that enables the observer to estimate uh, the input even if it, it, it lives in a finite dimensional space. So if you put back the observer in the original coordinate, then you get, you get this. This is uh, rather classical. Um, so the form of having a copy of the plant plus some injection term is, uh, is the same as usual. So, for example, um, if, we, if we take a, um, this very classical bioreactor, this is the most simple bio possible bioreactor or, or reaction uh, system with um, a biomass, X is biomass, S is substrate, and um, we assume, we want to assume here that we are able to measure X, um, even if it is not that usual to be able to measure, measure X, um, this, um, in some problems, for example, uh, if you have a um, aerobic bioreactor, then basically measuring the oxygen concentration is um, not identical, but quite similar to measuring X. Uh, in any case, for the illustration here, it is um, uh, interesting to measure X. Uh, as I see. And then uh, we assume that we measure X. Um, we want to estimate the substrate concentration and the um, input concentration in the, in the um, inflow, as in, that we assume we don't know. And we assume this is a time varying signal that we don't know, and we want to estimate that. Um, for this, we, we are going to assume that the growth rate, mu of s, is a, monot um, it's a monotonic curve. Uh, this is a growing function. Um, and the dilution rate is a positive uh, value, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, now, we can, um, it is easy in this case to show that the observability map um, is invertible um, basically everywhere. So we have global observability, so it is in ba uh, basically possible to build the observer. The observer in original coordinates would look like this with a sine function here, and then um, it will. Uh, this, this, um, uh, and I want to show a couple of simulations. The unknown input is um, used for this simulation is just um, has uh, four components. Um, and if we would want to build an, a model for this signal, then, then we would require uh, a system, finite dimensional system of dimension seven. Yeah. Um, but the discontinuous observer, um, um, is able to estimate this is uh, um, at the beginning there is there is uh, uh, deviation but then it converges uh, rather rapidly and estimates um, all the, the the variables all the states and the unknown input um, rather fast I, I am not showing here what happens with noise but if the noise is relative is small whatever that means, um, it is still possible. Of course, it is impossible to compensate for the noise, but the error is bounded. If you use a high gain observer, then even in the absence of, of noise, it is impossible to recover exactly the unknown input because it doesn't have a model for that. So um, it, it, it does it quite well, yeah? but for example, for the unknown input, uh, there, is a, there is a relatively big error. And this is impossible to compensate, except you increase the gain and increase the gain, making more problematic the design of the observer. OK, this is, this is um, one problem where discontinuities are able to um, help in um, estimating 
um, variables for nonlinear systems. Now we come to, to this other topic, this, um, and this is uh, somehow strange because we are going to deal exactly with the same system, just we will, we will change the reaction rate. And it will, it will change the problem dramatically. Um, so, uh, in general, it is clear that uh, you need observability or detectability to be able to construct an observer. This is rather obvious for everyone. Um, however, the usual tests for observability, uh, the observability map, and so on, I mean the, the Jacobian of the observability map, they are local tests. So, what we usually check is the local observability. Yeah? Um, but it is possible, and, I, uh, and this is what I want to, sh to show you, is that uh, this is far from have, uh, if, if you have a system which is locally observable everywhere or almost everywhere, it is, can be very far from being observable, uh, observable globally. This is also not, n nothing new. Yeah. Um, in that case, if you have such a system, which is locally observable, but not globally observable. So every observer you construct has to be locally, has to be local. So it will work only locally, because there is no global observer, because you don't have the global observability property. Mm -hmm. um, what is, for me, a little bit strange is that this phenomenon seems to be not a mathematical curiosity, but it happens in many systems, apparently. I have, uh, the first system I look at that is the one I'm go going to present to you. This is a bioreactor. But I have seen that in many other ones. I mean, chemical reactors, electrical machines, for example, the, the sensorless problem in, in induction, induction machines. You have exactly the same problem. Yeah. So this seems to be a rather natural problem. And, um, and we have not learned to deal with that, uh, apparently. So, um, so the, these are kind, these are systems which are which have which have trajectories that are locally observable, but are indistinguishable from each other, which what is rather strange because if you if you test along the trajectories the observability the local observability, they are observable, but they are indistinguishable. You cannot say what is which of the trajectory is the true one in the system. So a possible solution for that is to build an observer that is able to give you not only one of the possible trajectories, what a local observer would do, but all possible um, trajectories, indistinguishable trajectories. And, um, this is the, what, what, I, what I come to call multi-valued observer. So an observer that gives you not just one possible trajectory, but all the possible tra trajectories for the system, given the input and output you are measuring. And this is possible, and here comes again the discontinuities. You can do that by using discontinuities. Because um, in some sense you have something unknown. So this, this, this work has been, um, uh, the first work on this uh, uh, has been done with Jesus Alvarez that um, unfortunately didn't come today here. Um, by the way, the, the previous one was a work done with uh, Denis Shan when I was visiting him um, seven years ago or something. Now, we are going to consider such a system. But the, syst the system I'm going to present to you is exactly the same system, the simplest bio system. The only difference with the previous uh, case, which was completely observable, globally observable, and we were able to, to estimate everything, is that instead of having a mon monotonic uh, growth rate, now we have a non-monotonic growth rate. Growth rate. Uh, this is, for example, the Haldane, Haldane law. Um, 
the rest is exactly the same. So uh, the, the problem is using the measurement of x and d, the dilution rate, to estimate s and the unknown input s in. The Haldane law is, as you all know, is of this form. And the problem here for the observability is very simple to see. Uh, you measure x, but the evolution of x doesn't depend directly on s, but on the value of mu of s. So what is important is which is the value of mu of s, not the value of s. But here, as we see here, mu of s, uh, given a value of mu of s, there are two possible values of s. So it is possible that a trajectory is hidden behind mu of s, let's say. Yeah. And that is exactly what happens. So it, um, if, if you make an observability analysis of, of this system, um, so if in, in the monotonic case, if uh, we have already said that, so observability map is globally invertible, so you have global observability, and you can also estimate the input, so this is a nice system from the observation point of view. But in the non-monotonic case, uh, the, the situation changes dramatically. Um, dramatically um, in the global sense, because locally it is not that bad. There is just one point where the local observability is lost at the maximum. This is the only point where the local observability is lost. So you can say, oh, that's not that bad. Yeah. But it is really very bad. Because um, globally, it is not observable. So to study, to truly study the observability, the observability map is not a good uh, way to study the observability, the global observability of this system. So we have introduced another way to, to do this analysis. I don't want to bring that here, no. um, but uh, we have you, we have you that with Alain uh, van der Bube um, for studying observability of systems with unknown inputs and so on in, in a paper uh, a couple of years ago. Um, but this is, this is a, another way to study the observability and so using this analysis um, it can be shown that the system is locally strongly observable almost everywhere. Uh, as I told you, just basically for one point in the state space or one curve in the state space there is the, the observability, local observability is lost but everywhere else, it is observable. It is true, it is locally observable, everywhere. So, um, local observers exist, and you can build a Kalman filter, whatever you want, and they will converge, if the initial conditions are small enough. In the region where you assume the trajectories are. Um, but it is astonishing that whatever, if, if you measure e e for any value of d and x that you measure, so you, you, you get a, a curve in d, a, you get a curve in x, and for every curve, there are two indistinguishable trajectories for the system. Not, it is not a seldom problem. For some trajectories, there, there are indistinguishable. No, every trajectory has an indistinguishable one, and what is even more astonishing is that the, they, they are not only in couples, they are only two. There are no three, no four, no five, just two. This is rather astonishing. I mean, in, princip in principle, when you look at the curve of, of the growth rate, then it is, uh, you can see why. And the system is not detectable. These indistinguishable trajectories, they use, they I cannot say never, but usually do not converge to each other, what, what means detectability. What is the usual type of, of losing observability for linear systems? Um, you, you recover them if, you, if they converge to each other. But in this case, these indistinguishable trajectories are not converging to each other, so the system is not detectable. So it is impossible to build a global observer for this system, because it is not globally observable. So, in, uh, I want to show you two, an example, simulated example. Um, I mean, we can write for this system, and in general we can write for, for
or a nonlinear system, the all the traject the indistinguishable trajectories. Indistinguishable trajectories mean um, that you measure exactly this uh, at the output and at the input you have exactly the same signal, but internally you have different trajectories. So these trajectories are indistinguishable because they have the same input and output, what the observer looks at, but internally they are different. So it is possible to write down uh, all these trajectories, a dynamical system describing all these trajectories, but um, I want just to show you a simulated example of that. So the <coughs> what, me, what, me, what we measure is the biomass um, and D, but I have not put D here. So we, the measurement for, th there are two trajectories here. This is, the two measured ones are the same. But the internal trajectories, the, the uh, substrate, there are two possibilities. This is the blue one or the, or the red one. And there are two possibilities for the input, producing this output. And these are the two, these two ones, red and blue one. So these two trajectories are in internally quite different, but externally they are the same. So you, the observer is unable to decide which of the two is the true one. Nobody can do that because both of them are, po are possible. And what is astonishing for me at least, I mean, the, the difference between the two possible S's are rather high, but the inputs are not that different. They are not that far away from each other. Um, and uh, in this curve, what we see is that, as I told you, um, the evolution of, mu, uh, of x depends on the value of mu. Of course, the value of mu in, two, in the two cases is the same. Yeah. So it is clear that these two values are in the Haldane curve uh, at the same level of mu, yeah. but there are two different values of s. Okay. Um, so this is the, the, um, the problem, I mean, the, the, this kind of observability. Um, problem, the system loses uh, global observability, um, and what can we do? Then the problem is it is impossible to build a global observer. The system doesn't allow to, to build a global observer. So observers will work locally, and this is what ha usually happens. I mean, this is what we usually do. We just build a extended Kalman filter, a Kalman filter whatsoever, and they will converge very nicely locally. But they will ne never be able to converge globally. Um, so one, po one possible solution, as I told you, is to try to be an observer giving us all the possible trajectories. I mean, it, um, it is better to know that there are two possible trajectories that and then just to get one and not knowing that there is another possible. I guess it is, uh, I think it is better to have all the possibilities. What we do with that information, this is another issue. But, um, but at least uh, it would be good to, to have an observer giving us all the possibilities. So this is the, the so-called multivalued observer. Um, and this is possible using a discontinuous injection. Term. And I, I will show you one possible observer for that. Uh, this is the part, uh, this looks ugly, but it's not that bad. It's not that ugly. Let me, let me go through the... the, the um, this is just the, par the, the part of the observer for estimating S. There is another part for estimating the, the unknown input, but I, I didn't bring that here. So um, this is the, the dynamics. This is rather simple in the sense that this is a copy of the plant, yeah. basically. Um, um, and the injection terms, phi1 and phi2. Phi1 and phi2 are here. These are a little, a little bit more complicated. They, they have a lot of terms. But what is important here the, 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 um, is that this term um, is a sine function. So it has discontinuity. 
it, it needs to have a discontinuity here in order to, to, to make the observer converge. And the rest are just mathematical expressions um, because we estimate here basically uh, mu, the uh, growth rate, we estimate the growth rate in some sense for this, uh, we look at mu first as an unknown input and estimate mu as a known input and from the unknown input from mu we can estimate two values of s yeah. you, if you know the value of mu then you have two possible values of s and that's it basically this is the observer it's, it's rather simple so this is an observer uh, able to estimate um, the two possible trajectories so just in a simulation um, we have here uh, how it how it works, this bivalued, in, the, in this case, multivaluedness means B, 2, because we have two indistinguishable trajectories. Okay. Um, so, um, in green, we see the true trajectory in the system. And then we see that the, um, in blue and red, we have the two estimations of the two observers. So we see that one of the observers converge to the true trajectory and the other one doesn't. Of course, it, it converges to the other possible trajectory because there is an indistinguishable one. Uh, mu is the same for, for all, so the observer converges to the true value of mu. X is the same because um, we, have, we are dealing with indistinguishable trajectories and the estimation of S in, we have again two estimations, the blue one and the red one. The true one, the true in the system, is the green one, and one of the observers, uh, one of the, uh, no, one of the values of the observer converges to this trajectory and the other, to the other possible uh, input. So, this observer is able to provide us with the two possible values of the trajectories for the system. Okay. Now, a third problem um, is to use integral controllers, but using discontinuity for that. So, um, a, a classical problem for that is if, if you have a nonlinear system um, and then um, where sigma is, for example, the tracking error. Um, I put here sliding variable because this is a way o also at lo of looking at higher order sliding mode problems. But um, I want to stress here more the tracking problem. Let's say. So sigma can be, s can be thought as a, um, the tracking error. So we want to track the output of um, some signal um, and sigma is this tracking error. So the objective is to bring the tracking error to zero. Um, and we assume that F, G, and H are not completely known and you can have perturbations and so on. Um, the problem is becomes um, manageable if we assume that the relative degree is, um, uh, exists and is well defined and you know that. So, um, we have to assume that. So, you, you know the relative degree um, and the zero dynamics is uh, well behaved. So we want to assume that. So if the relative degree is well known, then we, you can make a change of coordinates and write the system in the um, normal form, this is the Burns Isidori normal form, where W and B are functions which are not well known. But we assume that uh, B is uh, upper and lower bounded by two positive constants and W is bounded. So we assume also that this dynamics, the zero dynamics um, is well behaved, for example, it is asymptotically stable and then uh, basically we have to deal with stabilizing this system. Um, but since we don't know exactly val the value of W and B, then we can write it down as a this differential inclusion. So, because the derivative of rho, uh, of x rho, is not, uh, can take any value in this set. 
So this is the, uh, the interval between minus C and plus C, and this is the interval uh, between KM and KM, capital KM. And depending on who, the, then you, you have different values. So this is a differential inclusion, and the problem is to, um, to bring the states of this system, uh, this is also a multivalued system, a differential inclusion, to zero. So the classical solution of higher order sliding modes is very simple in some sense. You just take a state feedback, of course, um, so, uh, uh, and uh, you make it discontinuous. If you do that correctly, then um, it is possible to stabilize the, the origin of this system in finite time and independently of the value that this function takes and that the, this function takes. Yeah. Again, my, my way of looking at that is because the discontinuity is able to, to estimate the values of these two functions online, very fast and can compensate for them. Um, in, in fact, this is the way um, when you study the solutions of differential inclusion, this is one way to look at that. The problem of using these uh, higher order sliding mode solutions is that you get shattering because you have a discontinuous value of u. But we can look for another solution. And this is motivated basically by the classical PI control. Um, so, uh, to simplify things, I, I will assume that we have just, that, that the coefficient of u is 1. Um, this is just to simplify a little bit here. Uh, but, and w is not bounded, but its derivative is bounded. Because we are going to use an integral term to compensate for that, in order to avoid the discontinuous control signal. So what we can do is just to apply a state feedback. This is a state feedback um, and an integral term. So this is the classical, I mean, this is not exactly PI because the proportional part depends only on the output, but it's a state feedback plus an integral action. Um, we can do that in a continuous manner if theta these two functions are continuous ones, then we, we, if you, you can make them also linear. Theta 1 and theta 2, you can have them linear. But then it is impossible to compensate exactly for W, for example. Except W is a constant. Well, we all know that. I mean, I, integral control is able to compensate for constant perturbations. But the trick here is if you use theta 2 to be a discontinuous function, then you are able to compensate not only for constant values of w, but for um, values of w with a derivative that is bounded. And in, 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 uh, in, in fact, you can take any c by selecting correctly k1 and k2. So you can compensate for any perturbation with a derivative which is bounded. And this is due to the discontinuity of, of the integral term. So this is rather astonishing. And, um, so you have a PI controller dealing with time varying, being able to compensate for time varying perturbations. The only condition is that these time varying perturbations, uh, their, it, their derivative is bounded. OK. So this is the, the, the scheme. This is rather classical. The only difference is how these functions look like. They are not linear. Yeah. And in particular, this one is a discontinuous one. This is important. And you need an observer also to estimate that, and so on. So the scheme is basically the same. Uh, the, the, what is nice here is that you get a continuous control signal, because the discontinuity goes through the in integrator. and. So you don't get the same chatteriness with the discontinuous controller. 
Um, so, if, we, if you insist in using con constant, um, continuous um, feedback, integral feedback functions, theta 2, then you are, also, you are able only to compensate for constant uh, values of W. That means the derivative of w, w is equal to 0. You can also use, again, exosystems to, to model the value of, of W. You can put a, an exosystem trying to model uh, how W behaves, and then you get a more complex system because you have to introduce the exosystem in the control loop and so on. You can do that, and you get very nice results, surely, but they are much more complicated. Here, we just use a discontinuous function, a sine function, and that's it. So, again, my explanation for that, or the way you can look at that, is that this discontinuous function is able to, um, to model this, the, all the values of W and to put them in the feedback loop and to compensate for them. So it is able to, 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 to estimate them because it is an internal model for a class of signals. This is a way of looking at that. It doesn't change the proof, but I think it is uh, it's nice to look at that in that form. Um, so this, this discontinuity makes very simple the controller, and um, you, you can see that, because you can prove that the, the, the state the, uh, of the integrator estimates in finite time the value of W, and then it can compensate for it. Um, for, for the relative degree equal to 1, this is the classical super twisting in higher order sliding modes. If, if you know about that, if not, then it doesn't matter. But it is classical in this case. Um, and you can use continuous or discontinuous observers to close the loop. Um, and to finalize, okay, um, I want to, to bring some experimental results. Um, this should be a bioreactor or something. Um, but it's not. <laughs> it's the kind of extension of, of the conference, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry for that, but, um, um, but it is very nice to see that in this magnetic suspension system. Anyway, um, so what we have here is um, this system, you, you probably know about that. This is a magnetic suspension system. You, you have a disk, and you have here in this case two to uh, electrical magnets, and you can move the, the disk, and you, you want to put that, for example, at some point. But there is, in, in this realization, uh, there is an important thing here, and this is this step. You have a step to, to, to avoid that the disk goes away somewhere. But this will bring a, a problem for the control here. Now, this is the model of the system, this is a classical model, by the way, in this, for this system, we have also, this, this system is indistinguishable. It's not, not globally observable because of this quadratic term here. If you, are, if you don't measure u, what is a little bit artificial, but if you assume that you don't know u, then it is impossible. There are all, always two indistinguishable trajectories, which are very easy to, to see why. But this is not the point here. Yeah, this is the, the model. Um, I mean, the only point is that the, this problem is not so strange as you can imagine at the beginning. So this is the system, and um, what we want to do is to bring x1 to, to follow our reference. So we write the system in the uh, tracking error dynamics, yeah? and we put here this state feedback. looks ugly, but it's rather simple in some sense, because this is just a state feedback. This is, you, you feed back the three, three states, E1, E2, and E3, with some comical um, powers. And then this is the integral term, um, which is um, this power. So uh, this is a family of them depending on a parameter D. I will not go into the details. I, I will look at basically two values of that. If D is equal to zero, then we get a linear feedback, the classical linear feedback with a linear integral term. 
And if d is equal to minus 1, then we get this at this continuity. This is the sine function, so you have the one I want and wanted to present to you. So let us look at some simulation, uh, not, not simulation, experimental results. And what you see is that the position, I mean, the, the blue one is the, is the linear one. Um, the, and the green one is the discontinuous one, and, and black one is the reference. So what, what we see is that the discontinuous one is able to follow rather well um, the, the green one. Uh, uh, the red one is some other controller in between. This is non-linear, but it's continuous. Um, so the, the, the linear controller is rather unable to follow the trajectory, to track the trajectory. Yeah. But, but the green one, you, you cannot distinguish basically from the, um, from, from the reference. Yeah. If you look at the uh, tracking error, then it is easier to see that in, the, in this. Yeah. So that the green one is rather exact. I mean, uh, the tracking error is rather small. Yeah. And compared to the blue one, the, 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 the linear one is rather unable to, to track it. And the problem, in fact, is that this step, the step brings some um, friction. So it is quite problematic. It is not in the model. This friction is not model. But it, it comes in the experiment. So if you want to bring the, 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 the disk to a point, then um, if, it, if you are not able to bring that very well there, so it will slow down, and then the friction will make it very difficult to move. So this is an extra, let's say, um, problem uh, here. But what we see is that the linear control is rather unable to deal with that. But the discontinuous one is able to, to deal with this uncertainty. It was not in the model. Nobody kn knew about that. I mean, nobody in the sense, in the design and in the model. But it's rather uh, good at uh, doing that. So what, what we see here in the, in the voltage, this is the uh, control variable, what we see is that the uh, discontinuous controller is applying is moving around very uh, strongly. And this creates a very classical solution for this problem. Yeah, exactly. That you introduce uh, some, um, how is it? Cheater. Yeah. So that, that you avoid this, um, this um, um, friction. Yeah. And uh, so it is able to move nicely and to bring the, the position of the disk uh, to the correct point. Okay, with that, um, I want to finish. These are the, the other variables. Um, now, to, to finish, I, I have shown you some simple uh, systems and some problems where these continuities are able to deal uh, rather well and simply with some of these problems. And the, it is crucial in some sense to, to get mathematically at least, uh, uh, the correct solution. Um, so, there are many issues of sh for sure here. Um, effect on, of noise, I have not spoken anything about that, and this is rather important. I mean, noise is rather important. If you have this continuity, then you, ha you get a lot of problems with noise. Yeah. Um, implementation, how to do that, um, and many generalizations. Um, uh, one point that is interesting here is can we use multi-valued observers to do control, for example? I don't know that. I mean, this is a very interesting question. Beyond estimating all trajectories, can we do that, something with that, yeah, for control, for example? And the last lesson is, I think, these are very simple examples, but still we can learn a lot from them. Or at least I have learned a lot from them. So, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jaime, for this very inspiring didactic uh, presentation. Are there any questions in the room? Thank you, Prof. Moreno. That is a very clear uh, presentation.
patient, uh, the discontinuous, uh, the discontinuity of uh, the, the function is the function is discontinuous. We we shall obtain a, a convergence in finite time, and uh, we shall convert exactly to uh, the, the trajectory, uh, even the, uh, with unknown dynamics. But in practice, how to implement the sine function? You have always something <laughs> which cannot be done. And therefore, you cannot obtain, uh, obtain the results uh, which are uh, states in theory. Uh, the, second, uh, the second point is the, the noise. In fact, I I think I believe. Uh, one question. No, no. It's in uh, in uh, uh, in uh, relation with this question. I believe that the the sliding mod the sine function is uh, as the high gain observer with uh, uh, infinite gain. We cannot implement high gain observer with, um, because for the high gain observer we obtain exactly the same thing. If uh, we, uh, we choose the game uh, infinite. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I would say in, so, in some sense, there are high gain observers, for example, for the observation problem, high gain observers and this kind of discontinuous observer are two ways of looking at the same problem. Uh, and you say, okay, a discontinuity is, is the same as a linear function with a very high gain in the limit. No. Yes, you can do that. Um, I would say theoretically they are two different ways of looking at the same problem yeah. um, and they should deliver basically the same things, I mean um, similar things at least, uh, because it is not quite true that uh, a discontinuous function is the same as a linear function with a high gain, it's not exactly the same, but let's say qualitatively you get the same. Uh, but what is, what is interesting here is that in a high gain observer, which is a linear one, you put a high gain everywhere in the, in the whole state space. With a discontinuous um, observer, for example, you put a high gain locally. In the rest of the state space, you don't have high gain. Not only locally. Yeah. This, is a, this is a difference. If it is very important, I don't know, but but it's different from that because to because for the for the high gain you have to put the gain high everywhere here you can put it locally yes okay but thank you Jaime unfortunately we don't have uh, too much time for more questions I have uh, just a personal announcement uh, on behalf of uh, some posters who are waiting their authors at the secretariat so please uh, come and uh, take your, your posters uh, at the secretary for those who let them. Thank you very much and let's thank again the, the speaker. <laughs> I name her.